Okay, folks. So, we're approaching the end of our study of the book of Hebrews. Um, towards the end of chapter 12 here, we have one more chapter to cover the book of Hebrews. After we finish that in the coming weeks, we will jump into a study on the book of Acts. And I'll have those handouts for you as well. Okay? Um, for those, I know several of you in here go to the Wednesday afternoon class. Um, at 1 o'clock, so I'm teaching a church history class. It's being recorded. And so if you cannot make it, uh, you can come and see me. I can give you a book and a, a verse packet. And you can follow along. It's on the church's YouTube page. And we're trying to get it posted there at least... Um, I teach it on Wednesday. We're trying to get it posted by Friday or Saturday if you want to follow along with that. So, um, like I said, Hebrews chapter 12, I'll start reading in verse 18. We will read through verse 29, taking us to the end of this chapter. But let me open in prayer first. Father, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you that you are here with us and you are guiding us. Lord, we thank you for another Lord's Day to celebrate you, to worship you, to praise you, to sing to you to pray to you, to get into your word, to have it preached, to have it taught. Lord, we thank you that as believers, Lord, as Christians, we have the Holy Spirit within us. And we have your word before us. And Lord, because of your blessing, because of your wisdom, because of your righteousness, because you opening our eyes and having ears that here, Lord, that you gift us. Lord, we can read your word and we can understand it. We can read your word and apply it to our minds and our hearts, Lord. And it will change our behavior. It will change our speech. Lord, we will be made more like your son. So Lord, help us today. Truly focus our minds and our spirits to understand your word today. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Verse 18 of chapter 12 of Hebrews. Here we go. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire into darkness and gloom and whirlwind and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words which sound which was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command if even a beast touches the mountain it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will they, we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken, as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude, by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. All right, let's walk through this. As you know, the author here has been warning the church. Warning the church in general. Warning given to the Christians, the true believers, whether they are Jew or Gentile, that they have salvation in Christ alone. It is not something that they have earned. It is not something they keep by their works. It is not something that they have possessed because they are following the law of Moses. He is also speaking and preaching through the words of God in this book to the unbelievers in the midst of the church service. Those coming together on the Lord's Day, curious about who Christ is, about this Messiah, curious as to why these Jews have left 
the temple service, why these Jews have left the synagogue service and are coming together in these little house churches and they're singing and learning about this Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah. So he's speaking to two groups of people here, true believers, but also, also those that are not true believers. And he continues this warning, this teaching from the Old Testament that salvation is not found in the law of Moses. Salvation is not found in being a Jew or following the laws, but salvation is found in the Messiah alone. And he keeps comparing the, sal the salvation. And he keeps comparing this Messiah Jesus with the Old Testament. Showing that the Old Testament was always pointing towards Jesus being Savior and Lord. So look here in verse 18. Okay? And he's going to contrast here Israel as recorded in, in the book of Exodus and also in the book of Deuteronomy. They're there on the mount at uh, the base of Mount Sinai, and they're seeing this, this, this presence of the Lord, this lightning and thunderings, and this cloud uh, of the Shekinah glory. And we know Moses is up there on the mountaintop, and he's receiving the law, and they're just in awe of this presence of Yahweh upon Mount Sinai. Okay? And he's taking that, that true historical event, and he's then comparing it to us approaching the one true God, the one true Messiah, Jesus. It says, For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched to a blazing fire, to darkness and gloom and a whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words which sound with such as those who had heard and begged that no further word be spoken to them. This is the same God. Jesus is the Son of God. He is the same God that was present on Mount Sinai. But rather than understanding that it's an unapproachable God, this God that was, that was this darkness and this power and this Shekinah and this lightning and thunderings that caused fear and awe and reverence as we see with the Israelites on Mount Sinai, it's the same God, the same power, yet because of the Son of God, because of His perfect life, His perfect death, His perfect resurrection, this God, the veil has been torn, and this God, if you will, is approachable, personable, relationship-based with the Son of God. Okay? So, if that is true, if it is true that the salvation and this approach and this relationship is true with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit... You Jews, don't run back to temple worship. Do not run back to synagogue service. Do not run back to the law of Moses thinking that is the way. It is not the way. The way is through Christ alone, through faith alone, because of God's grace alone. All right? Uh, uh, further details there in verse 20. For they could not bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountains, it will be stoned. This holiness, the sovereignty of the one true God, Yahweh, they knew that if anything had even touched the mountain, it was to be killed because of His holiness. And even His uh, servant Moses, look at verse 21, so terrible was the sight, or um, awe-inspiring, so uh, uh, fall down on your face in the presence of the glory of God. Even Moses says, I am full of fear and trembling. Okay? There's this reverence, this awe, this fear, this trembling that we are to have before the Lord God. And yet, in the Son of God, in the Messiah, He is our Abba Father. We have this close, intimate relationship with Him. He has all of His holiness, all of His sovereignty, all of this power. But because of Jesus the Messiah, we have this intimate relationship with Him. So he says, so terrible was the sight that Moses, I am full of fear and trembling, but you have come not to Mount Sinai, he says in verse 22, you have come to Mount Zion. Now he uses this word Zion. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a deep word, a loaded word for the Jew. Zion represented God, the one true God dwelling amongst us. That's why the temple is there on Mount Moriah or Mount Zion in Jerusalem. The reason it is there because He is dwelling amongst us. 
But here, Mount Zion is not just some mountain in Jerusalem. This is Jesus himself. He is Mount Zion. Very much what, what Nate was preaching this morning, that he is the water, he is the light. He is the light of the world. Okay, so you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. Not the earthly Jerusalem, but the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. You are a citizen. You have access to this new city, this heavenly Jerusalem, because of Jesus and His sacrifice upon the cross. So you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And again, if you want to study more about that, it's found in Revelation chapter 20 and 21 and 22. This heavenly Jerusalem. This place where believers, both Jew and Gentile, are going to dwell forever with the one true God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. So not only that, this Mount Zion, this city of the living God, this heavenly Jerusalem, this new Jerusalem, it says also there to the myriads of angels. Okay, Now this myriads of angels, this is millions upon millions is what's being expressed here. Millions upon millions upon millions of angels there in the heavenly Jerusalem, in this new Jerusalem, before the throne room of God, we have Father, Son, and Spirit. We have these millions and millions of angels. And then we also have those who have been saved by this gracious God, both Old Testament and New Testament. Okay, Make sure we pay attention to verse 23. There's a lot contained in this verse. It says, before the heavenly Jerusalem, these myriads of angels. And then it says, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. All right? Start at the end of verse 23. The spirits of the righteous made perfect. Okay? Those who have inherited eternal life. Old Testament or New Testament. Before the cross or after the cross. God was in the business of saving His people. Okay? Those whose names have been written in the Lamb's book of life, they are the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Made perfect in Jesus. Okay? So that's, who, that's this, uh, this description, this definition of what we're talking about here. So it's the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Those who have died have been raptured, brought into this heavenly realm of God. Now, back to the beginning of that verse, to the general assembly... And then it says, and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. Those who have a place in heaven, okay, they are God's chosen. Those who have been gifted this salvation. But there are different types of saved individuals. This first one is of the general assembly. You need to be thinking from the time of the Garden of Eden, okay, to the time of John the Baptist. Well, we would consider Old Testament, this general assembly, okay, dominated by Jewish people, by the Israelites, okay, but there are also Gentiles as well. But pre cross, Old Testament, this general assembly, okay, Adam and Eve and Abel and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Elisha and Elijah. King David and King Solomon, going through the, the prophets of Isaiah and Ezekiel, and all those true believers in the one true God make up this general assembly. Okay? And they are saved the same way as anyone is saved. That is by the blood of the Messiah. Okay? The atonement made by Jesus on the cross this general assembly, but it doesn't stop there. It's not just the Old Testament believers have been saved, but it's also what is called the church of the firstborn. The firstborn, this goes into the first fruits of the resurrection. Jesus is called the firstborn of creation, the firstborn of the second of this glorified resurrection. Okay? This church... It's a different type of saved individual. Okay? Old Testament, 
you have Old Testament patriarchs, you have the Israelites, you have Old Testament believers. But there's this new entity, this new title given to those saved post-cross. And it is the church. It is the bride of Christ. The body of Christ. Created starting on Pentecost with the sending of the Holy Spirit to permanently indwell those of the church. Now the church, they can be Jew or Gentile, free or slave, man or woman, irregardless. They are saved post-cross and brought into this entity called the church or the beloved. Okay? You, reader of Hebrews, first century. You, reader of Hebrews in 2023. You being a part of this church. You are going to enjoy and have fellowship with and join with in the worship of God with all of the Old Testament believers, the assembly, as well as all those who have been saved in the time of the church. Does that make sense? Okay? The author wants us, the author wanted them, the readers, to understand this because they didn't want to separate, well, that's Old Testament, New Testament, and that may not be the same, and maybe they're in a different place than what we will end up being. No. We all, as believers, end up in heaven with Father, Son, and Spirit in this new heavenly realm, this new Jerusalem, and then you'll read in Revelation, the new heavens and new earth, we all end up there because we all share the same Savior. Does that make sense? Okay? Question. So, what are the spirits there um, and to the spirits of the righteous? That's the general description. Okay? So the general description there, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Uh, a spirit of the righteous made perfect. That would be true of Moses or of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's true of me and you right now. We are spiritual beings and we have been saved by the Lord and we are called Spirit of Righteous. So I guess kind of what I'm wondering is after their death, uh, well, Jesus died after they died, so what? Uh, is that why they're referencing Spirit? Right, so, so when he's talking about, now remember, keep this in place, okay? Um, this general assembly and church of the firstborn enrolled in heaven, that we're, not, we're not at the end of the end yet, where everybody has their glorified, resurrected bodies yet. Okay? So he's saying the spirits of the righteous made perfect, whether it's Old or New Testament, we know that they will, pres they will be present before the throne room of God. They will be in that heavenly realm. Okay? Now, Revelation gives us kind of even more detail of how we're going to enjoy eternal life in these glorified bodies. Good question. I kind of heard you going down the church. Yeah, that's, that's what's going on here. Again, so Old Testament. Part of the too. Say this again. Should it be part of the general sentence? Or where, where does the tribulation saints fit into this verse? So, so track here. Uh, so verse 23. To the general assembly. Okay? We, we understand that that's Old Testament, right? Okay? And church of the firstborn. Still believers. Still spirit of the righteous, right? But that's in the church age. He, he is describing them separately, but then at the end of the verse, he's describing them as one large group called the spirits of the righteous. Does that make, kind of make sense? Okay. So, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God the judge of all and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, Him also being there, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. All right. So Jesus is there and present. Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, the one who is Savior of both Old Testament, New Testament believers. Notice there, He is the mediator of a new covenant. Okay. Again, this covenant... The Jews reading this, they read covenant. What, what is the first thing they think of? Moses and Mount Sinai and the Ten Commandments, right? And the covenant God made with Israel. That's the real covenant. 
And the Hebrew here, the author is saying, no, no, no. You have to understand, this is the culmination of the covenant written before time. And who is the mediator? Who is the guarantee that covenant for those Jew or Gentile, pre-cross or post-cross in the heavenly Jerusalem? Who is that mediator? Why is this covenant in good standing? Because Jesus, putting on flesh, living that perfect life, always doing the will of the Father, He seals that covenant with what? His blood. His blood. His role, His main role in that covenant between Father, Son, and Spirit. That covenant written before creation, but fulfilled in time. He is the mediator and He is the seal. He is the perfecter. He is the mediator of that new covenant in His blood. So notice there, notice, see what it says. Which speaks, actually it should be which speaks even better. Okay? Would be, I would think, a more accurate translation. Which speaks even better than the blood of Abel. Alright? So, oh, excellent question. Why does he go back to Abel? He's been arguing about the law of Moses and he's been arguing about Mount Sinai and, 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 the, and, the, and the Mosaic law. Why does he go back to Abel? Absolutely, we have this first given sacrifice, but also because you read about Abel and his sacrifice in what book of the Bible? Genesis. Do we have any Jews running around in the time of Abel? Nope. We don't have any Jews yet, do we? Okay, so what he is doing, again, this is the argument against going back to the Mosaic Law. It's an argument against going back to the temple system because not only is Jesus' new covenant, this covenant between Father, Son, and Spirit, this covenant in His blood, it is not only better than the covenant God made at Sinai with just the nation of Israel, it's even better than the covenant that goes all the way back to the time of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, encompassing not only Jews, but Gentiles. And this sacrifice, remember, Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve, they had direct access to who? To God Himself. Well, He was just talking about that, wasn't it? We have direct access to this one true God through not Abel's sacrifice, not through the temple sacrifices, but by what sacrifice? Jesus. So he's, he's arguing the lesser from the greater, the greater to the lesser. Mosaic, mosaic sacrifices, Jesus is still better. The covenant with Israel, Jesus is still better. Even going back to the Garden of Eden and Cain and Abel and all that, it's still better than the blood that Abel brought. That's why he does it. There is no argument. You can't go any further back then the first part of Genesis arguing, well, there's got to be some other sacrifice I need to do to have access to God. No, it is the new covenant in Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Messiah. That outranks all of them. Okay? Question. Yeah. What in, is it in Genesis or where is the first time it starts talking about Jesus' sacrifice? Well, technically it's Genesis chapter 3. That's the, the earliest uh, fancy word for it is the Proto-Evangelion, the ancient gospel, where God says He curses Adam and Eve and He curses the earth, right? But the gracious part of it is that there will be one that comes that I will send. He will crush the head of Satan. Remember that in Genesis 3? Okay, That snake crusher is who? Jesus, the promised Messiah. So there, God in His patience, but also foreshadowing, He's showing that the ultimate fulfillment of covenant and salvation is going to come through this snake crusher, Jesus. Make sense? Excellent question. Good job. All right. Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, sprinkled to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Okay? So then the warning starts. See to it that you do not refuse Him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused Him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from Him who warns from heaven. Okay. Now, this is to the general audience of this reader. It's to us here in this room. 
Specifically, the, uh, the author's intent here is to that Jew sitting there, okay, fully understanding the Old Testament, fully understanding the Mosaic Law and the temple services, okay, and he's saying, you know you've been exposed to a lot of the revelation of God. You not believing in Christ, you refusing the gospel, you are going to go to the most dangerous place any human being can go. It's one thing to be an unbeliever, an unbeliever in ignorance. Okay? It's that, that is, that you're still an unbeliever. You will still suffer for the wrath of your sin that is not covered because you've died outside of Christ. That's a horrible destiny for those. But there's a warning here. There's actually an even worse punishment for those who are consistently exposed to the revelation of God, specifically to the gospel of Jesus Christ. See to it that you do not refuse Him who is speaking, because you're not going to escape from His wrath. Even you thinking about doing a good thing of, well, yes, I'm going to go to the temple. I'm going to do my sacrifices. I'm going to do exactly what the Old Testament tells me. That is not going to be a path of escaping His wrath. It will not. You're actually going to a more horrific end if you do that. All right? See to it that you do not refuse Him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused Him who warned them on earth, Old Testament, Mount Sinai, Israelites, much less will we escape who turn away from Him who warns from heaven. There is even greater judgment, even greater judgment upon those who have a fuller exposure to the Gospel and a further exposure to the Revelation because it says here, warns from heaven. This warning from heaven, this is the fulfillment of the New Testament Scriptures. This is the full Gospel as presented of Jesus Christ and who He is. The, the, if you will, encompassing even the, the speaking, the, the speech of God the Father at His baptism. Okay? This is the full warnings of His, of his Gospel, of His life, His ministry, His death, and even His resurrection. Yes? I don't understand. We are chosen. What? Well, why, why is this worse? Because who... I just don't understand. Okay. The reason... This is what human beings, this is what we struggle with, right? Every time the Gospel, Jesus, the Son of Man... And this, this avenue, this, this, this revelation of the plan of salvation, every time it is preached and taught, is it done as a question or invitation, or is it done as a command? As a command. It's done as an imperative. You go and preach, and it is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? You are commanded. There is human responsibility. Okay? So, you are commanded to believe. These people have been commanded to believe. All right? Now we know this. We would never take credit for our own salvation, would we? Okay? But if there are unbelievers reading this book, what is still in their heart? Sin, absolutely. Their own fallen nature, their own sin. On top of that, who else is blinding them from the gospel? Satan himself. Okay? So what the author here is doing, he is following the commands of his Master. I am preaching. I am saying, believe, believe, believe. And he is warning them at the same time. Warning them at the same... Just, just what we heard this morning from the preaching. There's this, I am the light of the world. Alright? Did they have understanding of all those details? No. But at the appointed time, God would open their eyes and they would see the light of the Gospel. And that's what he is doing here. He is fulfilling this command of sharing the gospel. As they read this, will they all become believers? No. Will many take the wide path, that wide gate, and not believe? Will many go down that path? Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. But does the author know who is chosen, who is not chosen? He doesn't. So what does he do? He shares. He is like that sower and he throws that seed. He doesn't care where it goes. 
He just keeps sowing the gospel seed. And that, that's what we are to do. And, but he warns them. He warns them. If you're hearing this and your, heart is, and your heart is hard and you are embracing sin, there's punishment. There's wrath to come. Okay? So as you are exposed to this revelation, you need to understand that it is important. So it says, who turn away from Him who warns from heaven. On top of this, Martha. This is also a prophetic utterance. Okay? This is a prophetic utterance. There will be a time that we read about in the book of Revelation during that last uh, 70th week of Daniel, that tribulation period. There will actually be an angel sent. And he will be in this, if you will, the heavens, the space, the atmospheres above the earth. And he will preach the eternal gospel of Jesus, the Son of God, to who? Everybody on the planet. Everyone will hear from this preaching of the angel. So this is, this is an allusion to, this is a prophetic utterance of this warning from heaven. This is the preaching from the heavens of the angel in the book of Revelation. Now, will God save some as this preaching of the angel? Yes. But as we read the book of Revelation, the majority of people do what? They turn against it. Embrace their sin. Worship uh, Satan, the Antichrist. And they will still not bow their knee to the one true God. So again, the prophetic utterance here of this voice from heaven. Alright, let's continue. Verse 26. His voice shook the earth then, speaking of Sinai. Okay. But now He has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. Another prophetic utterance going to the book of Revelation. Okay? Specifically there, he's quoting from the book of uh, Haggai. Okay? Uh, Haggai chapter 2, verse 6. I'm sorry. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also, and the dry land. Fulfilled in Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 20. And then again in Revelation chapter 21. The three major earthquakes as recorded in the book of Revelation. So not only does He shake the earth, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens themselves. This is where we get into, you study prophetic uh, books, book of Daniel, book of Ezekiel, book of Joel, book of Revelation, about the stars falling from the sky, uh, the sun and the moon not giving off their light. So He not only is going to shake the earth as He did in the time of Israel, the time of Mount Sinai, but it's going to also happen at the end times as well. So He's given this prophetic utterance these prophecies in verse 25 and 26. Look at 27. He says, This expression yet once more denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Okay? Speaking of creation itself, the earth itself, the universe itself will be shaken, will give this testimony to Jesus the Messiah and His rule. But it will say, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Father, Son, and Spirit, the Word of God, the souls of men and women, those are things that are eternal and last forever. Question, Chad. Uh, chapter 2, verse 6. Yep, sorry about that. Yep, Hag um, this, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven itself. That's a Haggai. Yeah, Frankie? Well, originally we have the shaking of the earth with Israel and the receiving of the law on Mount Sinai and the great earthquake that happens. 
um, you have a foreshadowing of it at the death of Jesus. Remember, there's a great earthquake there as well. The ultimate fulfillment of this is the book of Revelation and all of the shaking of the heavens and the earth and all of the celestial signs that the end of time is coming and He's about to rule and reign. Okay? Good question. All right. So the expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. The ultimate fulfillment of verse 27 is the new heavens and the new earth. The new heavens and the new earth. Where sin is done and it is dealt with. The sin of Israel is done and dealt with. The sins of the earth, the sins of unbelievers, the sins of even those in the church are done and dealt with. And we are in the new heavens and new earth. There is no sin. There is no darkness. There is only eternal life and bliss being with the Son, the Father, and the Spirit. So the, Those are the only things that were not created, isn't it? Father, well, Son, and Spirit. Father, Son, and Spirit. Everything else has been created other than the fact that the Word of God technically has always existed. Okay? Though recorded for us in time through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but because the Word of God is so closely related to the Son of God, in fact, He's called the Word in John chapter 1, and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Okay? So although it is given to us in history, it has always in the mind of God existed. So in a sense, it's eternal. Now, the souls of men and women are technically not eternal. It's a, technically, it's a different word. The souls of men and women are immortal. That means they are created, they have a beginning, but last forever. That's true of unbelievers and believers. Okay? Say that one more time. Okay. Eternal, you need to think Father, Son, and Spirit. Eternal. No beginning and no end. Why do they say we will have eternal life then? Um, because it's life within us given to us by eternal ones. Father, Son, and Spirit. Okay? We, are, we men and women, have immortal bodies because did you have an actual beginning? Are you a creature? Yes. yes. Okay? This is, this is why it's such a big deal. Uh, and there are denominations, not denominations, there are cults out there who say that Jesus is a created being. Well, when you say He's a created being, he is, you're saying that He is not actually eternal. Okay? You and I are created beings. Alright? We have created souls, created bodies, created spirits. We have a beginning... But they're immortal. It never ends. The unbeliever has an immortal soul. Okay? But dying outside of Christ, that immortal soul, and they'll have a resurrected body, will spend eternity where? In the lake of fire. The immortal believer, one who is created, has a soul that will never die, will have a glorified body, and will have eternal life where? New heavens, new earth, right? Okay, You see how they both last forever, but they have a beginning. That's the word immortal. Okay, You would never say that I am eternal or that you are eternal. Okay, Because if you do that, you actually are claiming to be what? God. So don't do that. Okay, That's what we just talked about. Well, that's why we're clearing it up. Okay, question. The word in Eternal life is imputed to us. Yes, it's a gift given to us. The one who gives life has life in of himself. So we'll learn a special word here. Only God has what is called a seity. A S C E I T Y. A seity. Okay? That's the theological way of explaining it. The Bible says he has life within himself. God is the only being that has being and life within Himself. No creation, no beginning, no start. You and I do not have a seity. Not only Jesus and the Holy Spirit? 
Father, Son, and Spirit, they have a seity. Yep. Which is why we have to be really careful when we say, Jesus didn't become the Son of God when He was born in Bethlehem. He has always been the Son of God. So theologians, we come up with this word called the incarnation. He has a putting on of flesh. Becoming human. Okay? It is true, the Son of God is eternal, but there was a time when He was not human, right? A time He put on flesh. Now don't miss this. Okay, Part of the covenant He makes with Father, Son, and Spirit, part of the covenant says, I will put on flesh and I will remain in flesh for how long? Forever. That's a part of His humbling. His submission to the Father and the seal of this covenant that's in His blood, He says, I will remain in human form so that I can be their high priest for how long? So that you will have what type of life? Eternal life. Because your high priest is divine and human at the same time. Again, showing that you are not the keeper of your life. What's up? Absolutely, you can. I just want to thank you be good. Uh, this last week, I have a Mormon friend who in our Mormon surroundings here. He, he lost his leg. His name is Trax, but lost his leg. And I was talking to him about that. And he said, um, I can feel it there, it's just not there. He said, that's because I'm eternal. And I, I spiritually have a leg. I physically don't have by will of heaven. Well, so I, I, like, I think in our more Roman surroundings, the Roman Paul teaching is not just that Jesus was uh, created, but also that we are spirit beings who have been eternal. And ultimately, and I think in most facets of Mormonism, we become gods ourselves or are already gods ourselves. So if you're talking about your eternal, the only uh, conclusion is that you must be a god, which ironically is what Mormonism is. So yeah, it's very tricky and very absolutely, absolutely dangerous. And, and it goes back to the absolute original sin of Satan saying and declaring that what? Well, I want to be on the throne. I'm going to be God. No different. Nothing new under the sun. Sooner or later, we want to be on the throne, not God. All right? So, excellent, excellent point. So, verse 26, he shook the earth then. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes removing of those things which can be shaken, as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, right? We see those therefores. What does that mean? i got to keep all what I just learned in my head. Okay? Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken... Let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. This is really cool what the author does here. So he's been arguing from the Old Testament, comparing uh, angels and, and the, the Moses and the law of Moses and, and the kingdom of Israel and all of this stuff to what they're used to and used to reading about and using to having hope in. But it says... We receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken. So he's referring back to what he just taught about in Haggai chapter 2, that there's the shaking of the earth, shaking of the heavens in the future, okay, in the book of Revelation. But don't miss this. Even then, as much pride as they had of being a descendant of Abraham, an Israelite, they were living in an Israelite kingdom that wasn't even ruling itself. They had already been conquered several times. So since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, it won't be shaken by God, by angels, it won't be invaded by outsiders as you take this pride in Israel, okay? It cannot be shaken. Let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service, service with reverence and awe. So he's connecting what they had gone through in Sinai. What they were trying to cling to, going back to Old Testament, the Mosaic Law, and all that other stuff. He's saying, 
not only are you going to get that stuff, but this kingdom that you get is that and plus so much more. Don't just settle for this earthly kingdom of Israel in the temple. You're going to get all of those promises and more in Jesus. And it won't be shaken. And you're going to have this reverence and awe. And just like they were in reverence of awe of God's Shekinah glory on Mount Sinai, we will also experience that because our God is a consuming fire. And in that ultimate perfection of this, in the new heavens and new earth, who provides the light and the Shekinah glory in the new heavens and the new earth? Is there the sun or the moon or the stars in the new heavens and new earth? No. It is by the Lamb, the Son of God. He is the light for the entire creation in the new heavens and new earth. So do not settle for the Old Testament promises. Not only don't settle, remember He's warned them, don't take your exposure to the Old Testament truths. Don't take your exposure to Jesus and the New Testament lightly. Because if you refuse to believe, you've been commanded to believe, you refuse to believe there is actually a greater punishment for you. So drop all of that. Receive, embrace, believe in the one true God, the Messiah. All right? So that's there, the end of chapter 12. Question? So what, we talk about an acceptable service. Uh-huh. What is it? Okay, so the acceptable service in, in the Mosaic Law Old Testament, that would be, I, I believe in the one true God, and I'm going to go to temple. I'm going to go to synagogue. I'm going to do my services that God has commanded me to do. He's saying as much as that is good and proper for that time, you are now in the new kingdom. You are in this new covenant with the Messiah. And though you cannot earn your salvation, you can't keep your salvation, it doesn't mean that you aren't supposed to be doing services for the Lord. Not to earn it, not to keep it, but in thankfulness because you have salvation. Right? And we see this preached by Paul throughout his epistles. Right? Yes, you are saved by grace alone. Yes, you are saved by faith alone in Christ alone. And you enjoy that salvation and you can't lose that salvation. Because of our spiritual facts, unfortunately, our human nature, our fallen human mind start kicking in and saying, oh, well, I have salvation. And I can't lose it. I didn't earn it. Well, I'll just kind of kick back and do whatever I want. In fact, the more I kick back and do whatever I want, really what I'm saying is grace will abound. Now, what does Paul say to that? Don't ever have that thought. You'd be anathema to have that thought. If you, could just, if you think you're just going to sit back and do nothing for the Lord after He has saved you, it would be better for you never to have been born to have those thoughts. So Christian, don't go down that path. Be busy doing service and works for the Lord. Not for your salvation, but in thankfulness for it. Good question. Excellent question. Are we okay on chapter 12? Alright, let's go to chapter 13. And this, this last chapter of this book here, uh, 25 verses. Let me go ahead and read the first 14. That's kind of that first main section there. And then we'll finish up next week probably, or two weeks. All right. Verse 1 through 14. Let's hear in verse chapter 13. Let love of the brethren continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember the prisoners, as though in prison with them and those who are ill-treated, since you yourselves also are in the body. Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled, for fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. 
what will man do to me? Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be carried away by varied uh, and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, though which those who were so occupied were not benefited. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that He might sanctify the people through His own blood, suffered outside the gate. So let us go out to Him outside the camp, bearing His reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. All right, a, very much a summary, this last chapter, a summary of everything he's been teaching up to this point so far. Now, this last chapter, this is where most scholars are going to argue. This, this vocabulary, this structure, this language is so much like Paul. This, has, this book has got to have been written by Paul. He's just chosen to remain anonymous. Okay? It reads exactly like his other epistles. His language and his vocabulary is so similar to his others. This is again where scholars say Paul more than likely is the author of the book of Hebrews. All right? Notice this let the love of the brethren continue. Okay? Anytime the author, Paul, uses this word brethren, what he is talking about are men and women that are true, actual, real believers. They've been born from above. They've been saved by the Lord. They've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. They are of the family of God. Okay? Irregardless, Jew or Gentile, that doesn't matter. This is the body of Christ, true believers, the brethren. The reason he says this is because he's linking it to what he just said at the end of chapter 12, that other section of giving that uh, the exhortation, that command that we are to do acceptable service in reverence and awe to our God who is a consuming fire. So if that is true, you are a true believer, you are of the brethren. So let love of the brethren continue. Specifically, at least in their first century, stop it with the whole Jew and Gentile thing. Stop it with the whole free and slave thing. Stop it with the whole man and woman thing. And you can see in 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus, stop it with the old and the young thing. That doesn't matter. That stuff doesn't matter inside the church. But let the love of the brethren continue, irregardless of who you are. You are in Christ. You are of the family of God. Let the love continue. Not only that, it says, do not neglect the sh to show hospitality to strangers. For by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Now, it's easy to read this, but put yourself in the shoes of someone in the first century church. All right? Let's say you're a Jew or a Gentile. You're a believer in Jesus. You're following the Messiah. On the Jewish hand, you've been kicked out of the Jewish world. You have no access to the temple. You have no access to the synagogue. Your, your Jewish family has abandoned you. you. Worse than a black sheet of sheep of the family, they'll erase your name from all the records of that family. It is as if you don't exist. Okay, In the Gentile world, you are a weird outsider. You are believing in this dead Jewish rabbi, and this is your God. They would have no place in the Gentile world. Your world was your local body, your local church. On top of all of that abandonment of society and your family, unbelieving Jews and Romans are now wanting to do what to you? Arrest you and kill you. Okay? All of this mixed in together, but Paul is led by the Holy Spirit. He says this, even all that is true, and you're dealing with that, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. 
there were still those, Jew or Gentile background, and the Spirit is drawing them into these churches. Okay? The Spirit is drawing Jew or Gentile, called strangers here, okay, into the lives of these Christians, into the life of their church. Now, at first glance, right, at first thinking of all this, you're going to put up your walls and you're going to be careful, right? Because this could be like one of those guys that are going to sneak in and they're going to tell the Romans who we are and they're going to come and arrest us and we're all going to be crucified. That was a real threat that they had to deal with. So the easiest thing to do is, let's just put a wall around us, let's bunker down and try to separate it from the outside world and just protect our little 40 people in our little house church. But he speaks against that. He says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Right? Be smart about this. Right? But there's going to be those as you're preaching the gospel, they're going to want to know more about this Jesus. They're going to be curious about the gospel. Curious about what goes on in the life of the church. So he says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. All right? Do this. Not only because you're commanded to. That's the way it's written. Do not neglect. It's a command. All right? But there's actually, there's almost an extra bonus in all of this. In that, for by some have entertained angels without knowing it. As dangerous as it is, you're commanded to share this gospel, you're commanded to show this hospitality to strangers. On top of all of this, you could be entertaining, conversing with holy angels and not even know it. You have to remember, angels, created beings, but they are beings that can have presence in this earthly realm, but also in the spiritual realm. And many times we read in the Bible, they have this physical presence and appearance of human beings. Human beings do not become angels. Angels do not become humans. That's not what we're teaching here. Okay? This is... At certain times, God allows these angels to have this physical appearance of being human beings. And it's actually a blessing, blessing given to the church. Okay? So it says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. David, yeah. Um you do it, but you do it in a smart way, okay? As in, we have, we have elders, we have pastors in this church, right? We are to shepherd the flock, right? Sheep. The, the, the sheep are always the animal used to describe believers gathered together as a local assembly. Sheep. Naturally ferocious animals, right? Able to protect themselves, no, the exact opposite. It's the only animal looking for the quickest way to die. Okay? So the God raises up shepherds to protect the sheep. All right? So we reach out to strangers. It could be homeless. It could be something like that. But we do it through the shepherds who are keeping watch over the sheep. Does that make sense? We do it in a very careful way. Right? We, in our, for instance, just even financially speaking, there are certain avenues with deacons and with elders that we help these individuals, okay? Does that mean I want you in the parking lots talking with these people, giving them your money, and inviting them to your homes that evening? Please do not do that. Yes. We will help them. There are ways our church has organized all of this to help them, okay? Okay? Smart way. Shepherds leading you, all right? If there are ways that you're wanting to really do that in a concerted way, come and talk to one of the pastors. We promise you, we will help you find a ministry to do that. So okay? the ones on the street corners we don't give money to. Uh, not only is your pastor telling you that, every single police officer ever serving this area would say, do not do that. Okay? So do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. 
Don't stop there. Remember the prisoners. Again, this is argument for Paul being an author here. Remember the prisoners as though in prison with them and those who are ill-treated since you yourselves also are in the body. As one is treated inside the church, persecuted, arrested, imprisoned. Okay? If it happens to one inside the church, it's as if it affects all of the church. This is a very Pauline sentence. Okay? This is very... Uh, Paul was in and out of prison constantly in his ministry. All right? In fact, the, the, the false prophets and the false teachers that were infiltrating the early church, they would point to the fact that Paul being in prison meant that God's blessing wasn't on him and you shouldn't listen to him. So, so are we supposed to go to the prisoners? And yep. The, there are prison ministries absolutely that you can get involved in. Absolutely. Okay? I saw a hand somewhere. Yes? Just to go back for a second there to verse 2, I have a couple of questions. Uh, when it talks about entertaining angels, does this still happen today? Why yes. Is it like yes. The way, the way it is written in the original language, this is not like speaking in tongues or public healings and miracles. It's not written in that language where it was for a time and then ceased. This is written in, in, in the Greek tense where it is currently happening and will continue to happen in the future. Okay? So it is, by this some have entertained angels without knowing it, and that will continue. Okay? Could that happen today? Yes. It can. But you said they couldn't put on human bodies. Do what? You said the angels couldn't put on human bodies. No, they take on the form of a human. They don't become humans. Okay, this is the Looney, this is Looney Tunes theology, right? Where when you die, like Coyote dies, what does he become? An angel, right? That's not what the Bible teaches. And it's not that angels become humans. It's just that God, for a specific reason, allows these angels to take the appearance of humans. True in our time, true in the New Testament time. It was true in Old Testament times as well. Okay? All right, so remember the prisoners... And so those in prison with them, those who are ill-treated, since you yourselves also are in the body. All right, we'll stop there. But just know that the way this is written, this is, it just, it's screaming that Paul is the author of this book. And anything you read in this book, it's going to line up with his other epistles as well. When he speaks of brethren, the church, warning of the Jews speaking of angels, and even those in prison as well. All right? We'll pick it up in verse 3 and 4 next week. Questions or comments? Okay. Yes, sir? I so have a couple more. Why do the angels do this? Is it like a, a test that God... Nope. It's a blessing given to the church. It's a, it's a blessing given to us. Very much like we know we can't earn our salvation, but as you do ministry in the Holy Spirit... God rewards us, gives us crowns in eternal life, okay? This is, this is, if you will, a temporary blessing. As the church, and this happens, it tends to happen in the Scriptures, as persecution ramps up, spiritual warfare ramps up, God seems to work in and amongst angels around us when this happens, okay? So yes, it could still happen. Also know this, uh, before I go, on verse 2 it says, with or without knowing it. What does it say? It says without knowing it. So are you going to know when this happens? So then stop seeking for it and having you know all these different angel obsessions of is this an angel, is this an angel? I'm, oh, I'm going to do this because I think I'm going to go see an angel. That happens too. It happens too. If, this, if you are blessed in this, are you even going to know it? You're not going to know. So just be about the business of being a good Christian because you're commanded to. You'll be rewarded, but it's an extra blessing. You had another question about this? Yes. What is the hospitality when I talk about hospitality? What does it actually mean? Usually um, we're talking about time speaking with, so greeting. Okay, that's important because a Jew and Gentile would never greet each other, right? That you, you could tell from the way they're dressed, 
that's a Gentile, I'm not even going to speak to them. So automatically, this is why Paul also says, greet each other with a holy kiss, right? So I'm, gonna, I'm a Jew, I'm, I have to hug a Gentile, and I'm going to plant one on their neck. Really? Okay, so first, you've got to have this embracing of the stranger. Then normally this hospitality means food and shelter. Okay, we don't have a lot of holiday inns or restaurants. If this, if this stranger is wanting to come and visit a house church, okay, they're wanting to come and see what this Lord's Day service is all about with these Christians, more than likely they don't have a place to stay and they can't provide for food. So that would, that would automatically be incorporated in this hospitality. Good question. Anything else? So, yeah. So I'm taking it as inappropriate for people to pray for angels. What? Inappropriate for people to pray for the angels. Yes, do not do that. Absolutely do not do that. Yes, Nate. Just a plug. If you have more questions about the angel stuff, Nate and I did a what, four podcasts. Oh, I forgot about that. Yes. Series in depth on angels and demons, and he did a good job of real talk through some questions that he's had. Excellent. Yeah. On the app, I think on the website too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, something like that. Yep. It's good stuff. All right. Other questions? All right. Father God, we thank you for today. Truly, your word is um, what gives us light the light to understand Jesus and, and the Father and the Spirit. Lord, we thank You for today. We thank You that because of Your Word, because of the Holy Spirit within us, we can see these things. We can see these things as, as that church did 2,000 years ago. Because You are the author, Lord. As relevant as it was to them, it is relevant to us. So we thank You for that. And Lord, as we go out into this dark world, help us to be the light. Help us to share the gospel of Your Son, Jesus, with anyone that will listen. So Lord, truly we love You. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, folks.